Dr. Sen, are you ready? We're, we're good yes, to go. I'm ready. Yeah. Oh, you well, are. lovely. Um, so, so thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this uh, this Saturday evening. We're excited to have an extremely uh, distinguished physician, um, author, uh, clinician, obviously, and, 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 and an in-depth researcher in the field of internal medicine. And his own personal interests actually rests with this, uh, you know, very unfortunate condition called Alzheimer's that, you know, he spent years and years researching. Uh, Dr. Sen has today joined us from the East Coast in New York. So, uh, Dr. Sen, welcome once again uh, to Ivory Session. Um, we are quite uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, hearing from you. And, and we've got a bunch of questions from people on, uh, on that, that, you know, we want to uh, run past you. And but before that, uh, while I give an introduction, uh, Vishwa, can you just enable my screen sharing? I do want to share that this is actually Dr. Sen's uh, book that he that he wrote. And this came our way at Ivory. As you all know, we've been in the space of memory care for close to two years now. Um, but this book was clearly one of the crispest, most nuanced and most impactful books that, you know, our team uh, that me and my team members had read at Ivory. And we really value this opportunity to get uh, you know, and, and a session with uh, Dr. Sen to not only just talk about the book, but also, uh, you know, hear about his thoughts on the subject of dementia and, uh, and Alzheimer's. So, so once again, Dr. Sen, uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Vishwa, I still can't share. I can go ahead with the questions, actually. Um, <clears throat> so, so, Dr. Sen, here's the first question that we had from our group, which is that uh, the field of internal medicine, uh, you know, okay. this is, we've obviously heard of GPs, neurologists, uh, you know, geriatric medicine. Tell us a little bit about your own field and um, what is a good stage for somebody to seek an internal medicine expert? Because this is an extremely complex field and from the limited knowledge that I have, like uh, the, the, the experience that I've had with internal medicine doctors are that this is a, a, a section of doctors who are extremely well equipped across the most acute, uh, you know, cases, you know, you, you you actually come in probably in cases where people are in ICU, uh, where, you know, you require like multidiscipline intervention. Uh, but in your own words, A, just your personal story of why did you choose this? And B, uh, just for our audience, uh, at what stage, you know, do you normally come into a customer, uh, patient's life? All right. So first of all, before I uh, get in and uh, answer to your uh, question, which I which I think is a very relevant question, I'd like to thank you for uh, extending your invitation to me. We had had discussions in the past uh, about your uh, perspective, about your platform, about your organization, and I'll uh, and I laud you for uh, starting something like this. I think this is of tremendous necessity in our country, in India. And uh, as I was telling you a few minutes before, this is the type of buffer that we doctors lean on. Uh, when we see patients with uh, cognitive disabilities. You know, very frequently, I would actually you know, tell my patients to seek uh, advice from uh, organizations like you. Because sometimes, in, from a very pragmatic point of view, it's very hard to get an appointment with a doctor. You know, even for myself, when I see a patient, the next time I see the same patient, you're looking at five, six months down the road. So there is obviously a break in the continuity. And that's where organizations like you come into the picture. So once again, you know, uh, congratulations for all that you do, and thank you for uh, uh, for inviting me uh, to 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 have a discussion uh, with with all of you. Uh, to start uh, uh, today's proceedings with your question, what made me get into uh, dealing with patients or people suffering from uh, cognitive or mental inadequacies is uh, for, for two reasons. One is a very personal reason. It's, it's um, my grandmother, uh, she was, um, and I have that in my book, uh, she was a very erudite and a scholarly uh, individual. And uh, back in the days when women uh, were measured by how well they have brought up their children, she was an out and out scholar. Um, she, just a request to everyone to please be on mute while we are muting everyone. Uh, you know, sometimes it gets missed as you join. Would really expect everyone to be on mute, please. I think I can. I think I can make my way through these. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so yeah. 
So when my grandmother, who was such an erudite and a scholarly individual, um, one day he, she just left the house and, uh, and she was lost. And when, I, when we eventually found her, um, she had no recollection, no recognition. And, um, and I'm talking about many, many years back. You know, the concept of Alzheimer's just was beginning to take shape. And I wondered as a young boy, how could a woman with such incredible intellect turn into a vegetable? Now, 30, 40 years down the road, we still have the same question. So it's a very complex situation where we are dealing with the most complex organ of our body, which is the brain, right? Which is not to disregard diabetes, not to disregard high blood pressure, not to disregard high cholesterol. <clears throat> But just to say that our brain and the nerve cir circuits are, are very complex and the mind is very different from the brain. So, that is one, one aspect that has kept with me um, all my life, from a student to a medical student uh, to a doctor. So yes, I had a personal interest. Um, it's not that I was here, I'm here to solve that problem. But I wanted to be a part of this problem and be a part of the solution also. And in terms of my professional aspect, uh, the calling, uh, although it came from the heart, it also came from my mind because we are scratching the surface. And it's, it's very obvious if you look around the world, we are, we are gracefully aging. We are gracefully getting younger and younger. And we were 85 years old, only 20 years back. Now we are 85 years young. We were 90 years old, 20 years back. Now we are 90 years young. So physically, we are doing so much better. As a matter of fact, our middle age has been pushed back. It used to be 45, now it's 65. Because our cutoff used to be 80, now our cutoff is 1995. So obviously, the brain cannot keep up with the physical health uh, that you know, we are keeping up with. And it is emerging as a tsunami. And we have not seen the peak of cognitive disorders. We have not seen, seen the peak of Alzheimer's. It's, it's on its way. And uh, more and more research, more and more awareness, and more and more us, physicians, we need to stay there. I always say that um, when it comes to Alzheimer's, the best doctor is a family member. All of us are doctors here hmm. because we know so little. And I think um, the earlier you go to an internal medicine doctor, uh, the better, because time is like a diamond. Yeah. Mm. And before we fall into the slippery slope, we can still turn the things around. And once we get into the depth of this conversation, I'll be able to uh, convince, hopefully, mm. all of us uh, how, how and why we should seek a, a doctor's consult as soon as possible. Got it. No, thank you for that, uh, you know, extremely nuanced take. Uh, very, very interesting to actually know. So here's something that a lot of uh, people on our community want to know constantly. Um, are there <coughs> tests that are available to determine if people have early onset Alzheimer's? And doctor, it is here that, you know, you can bring in, you are at the cutting edge of medical advancement in US. Uh, and you also have a lot of visibility to the work that's happening in India. So if you can throw some light on, you know, this particular subject, It'll be great. Wonderful. Uh, there are a couple of blood tests that have uh, come up. Uh, none of them have been approved by, uh, let's say, FDA. Uh, and uh, none of them have been approved by the, the European uh, medical community. But they are cutting edge and they are coming up. They are, I'll try to simplify as much as possible. This yep. blood test, and I'm a very big fan of these blood tests, they are based on two basic pathology that happens in our brain when we get hit with Alzheimer's. Okay, And I'll, I'm going to give you a mouthful. I think it is very essential that this type of terminologies, they actually get into the community. They get into the streets. One is known as Tau, T-A-U. That's a type of protein uh, that creates a problem. And the other is a type of a plaque called amyloid. So now what the scientists have done is they are trying to measure the ratio or the presence or quantify the amount of this tau and the amyloids. Now the problem here is does that accurately reflect 
or predict that you and I will come up with the Alzheimer's. That is where we are stumbling. So these tests are actually great tests when somebody already has the Alzheimer's. If I have the Alzheimer's, if I do the blood test, I'm going to show these amyloid plaques in the blood. I'm going to show these tau proteins in the blood. But I think that the greater challenge is whether we can do beforehand and try to quantify this amount of taus and amyloids and predict, hey, you might have Alzheimer's 20 years down the road or your Alzheimer's is down the, is around the corner. That we have not been able to solve as yet, which is exactly why the, the medical fraternities, they have not approved of these blood tests. Now, but it's coming, it's evolving. I remain very hopeful that a much more precise test like sugar, like cholesterol, this will come up where we can actually apprehend that yes, we have an Alzheimer's or no, we don't have an Alzheimer's in the next 10 years. That's one aspect. The other aspect is, and that's, that's not cost effective, is to do the regular screening tests, which is doing a CT scan and doing an MRI. Now, this sounds very easy, but it's a very difficult proposition because I cannot go on you know, doing a mass CT scan and mass MRI on everybody's brain. And just because you don't have the evidences of Alzheimer's today does not mean that you're not going to have it five years down the road, which means I'm looking at a periodic uh, CT scan and MRIs, which is theoretically okay, but from a pragmatic standpoint, um, I, I don't think it is going to do. So yes, we have the tests to detect Alzheimer's when Alzheimer's is in, but to predict whether it's coming, which is the most important thing now. And I'll, and I'll let you know later why suspecting Alzheimer's is the most important thing here. And uh, to, finish your, to finish answering your question, we are also going back on the clinical questions. There are a set of questions that we ask, and that is where internal medicine uh, comes into the play. And as a matter of fact, I'll take the brave, brave step forward and say that family members, family mem members should have this set of questions to ask to their beloved if they suspect that there is something which is a little outside the normal. And it has its own name. One is an MMSE, which is a mini mental status examination. And the other is a Montreal Cognitive Assessment. These are the papers. These are the guidelines. These are the set of questions that everyone from the administration to the doctors to the government, they should give those papers to each and every family. And it's only a set of 20 questions. And those 20 questions are very simple questions. And you ask them and there's a score, you know, 24 out of 30. Anything more than 24 out of 30, you have passed, you've done good. If you have 20 out of 30, does not mean you have Alzheimer's, but it might mean that this is the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. And hey, you start the intervention right there. You don't wait till I don't know where my bathroom is. You don't wait when I don't know who Isaac John is. That's advanced Alzheimer's. But there are many things that will come much before these advanced things come, which can be captured through these questions. So I'm a big fan of these Montreal cognitive assessment tests. And here, when I practice, that's the paper that I'm giving out to all my patients. Right. If we are serious about our nation's health, these are the things that should come up. Those 20 set of questions, and it comes in different names. There are various companies that have released it. MMSE, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, is another one known as Sweet 16. Those are questionnaires, and they are valid scientific questions to find out whether you're functionally there or not. And that should be in every house, every household. And everyone should know about those 20, 25 questions. All right. So, yes, we have a blood test. Yes, we have CT scan and MRI. But, yes, we have something on hand known as those set of 20 questions that we should be using it very often with our family members. And as I say to my patients, with yourself. Yeah. And thank you for sharing perspective on that. And just like how we were discussing earlier, Ivory has also adapted one of those tests and, you know, has, has put it up on, on our website. So if anyone's interested, like do reach out to, 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 to me or, or Meher or Vishwa on this call. Uh, moving on, um, 
here's uh, you know here's where we get closer to your area of expertise i think this is your personal you know passion mission um, dr sen uh, you know let's begin very high level question i know you can go and on on and on about this but how about sharing a few tips on how can people keep their brain healthy to prevent alzheimers you know i i i would seriously have to simplify this because uh, you are absolutely correct this this question itself is a two hours lecture and and i would like to give that two hours lecture because it's very important prevention is the most important aspect of alzheimers any disease has a couple of phases we have anticipation we have prevention we have cure and we have care when it comes to alzheimers when we don't have the cure we have the care but we don't have the cure anticipation and prevention becomes the fulcrum becomes the pivot becomes the pillar so how do i prevent alzheimers how do i keep my brain's healthy i'll i'll break it down to four m's right motion music meditation and mindset these are the four m's that i would like to concentrate on and give me another minute or two to dwell on these four aspects what do i mean by motion now the easy word of motion is exercise now first of all why why do we doctors and scientists we think that exercise helps now obviously the easy answer is that exercise keeps us healthy and all but we have actually done serious research work where we have found out that when we exercise physically exercise there are certain areas of the brain those areas that gets hit with alzheimers those are the areas that actually grow when i say grow i means they have enhanced nerve activities electrical activities so that does not mean that you have to put your boots on the ground all the time walk if you love to dance dance if you love to run run if you can't run jog if you can't jog you walk if you can't walk just move your hands and feet and legs as i always say if you can stare you wink use all muscles of your body because motion helps in the enhancement of the electrical activities of those exact areas that gets damaged in alzheimers that's number 1 number 2 is music now again we have an easy answer for that okay of course music helps emotionally helps but we have done a tremendous amount of work in music i have i have shared this story countless number of times in various platforms even when i was addressing the united nations and i will share this story here again and i know there are audience here who would say dr sen you have spoken about this story many times before but i will still say this story because this is a personal story that i have many years back when i was called to see a patient in an icu the patient was in a semi conscious state and she was having suffering from difficulty in breathing and i realized that that difficulty in breathing was because she had a lot of fluid in her belly so i decided to take the fluid out of the belly and obviously she was in a state of coma so there was no question of talking to her or asking for any permission it was icu it was midnight so i suited myself up and i was about to draw the fluid from the belly when i realized oh geez and sure enough someone called me during that time and my phone started to ring in the middle of the stillness of a near midnight now that hap- that night happened to be a very special night it was 24th of december transitioning into 25th of december and i had changed the tune of my phone to a very profound gospel song joy to the world the lord hath come and it continued to play from the corner of my eyes i could see my patient gloria sanchez her eyelashes started to flutter and then she whispered she came out of the coma and she whispered is it christmas dark i responded it is christmas gloria she said merry christmas dark 
I responded, Merry Christmas, Gloria. The music died, the phone stopped, and she fell back into a coma. This shows the profound effect of spiritual music, their ability to go inside your brain where not even medicines can reach as of now. So I have personal experiences of how far music as a primordial language can traverse what words and least of all medicines can do. And on top of that, we have had tremendous amount of research that has been done. Andrew Newberg is an exponent of that, uh, where he actually played various types of spiritual music. And uh, it has been established again that those areas of the brain that get damaged with Alzheimer's get revived through music. So music, you know, people come to me all the time and they say, you know what? My mother has Alzheimer's. My father has Alzheimer's. My grand sister. What do I do? How do I talk to them? What do I tell them? I said, the first thing you should know is what not to talk to them. Because it is, it is a different equation now. You think that you are saying the right words, but it may not be the right words. Right? So the relationship is the same, but the interaction is different. Right? So words may not be adequate. I have all these various types of mental health organizations, you know, spouting like mushrooms. And when I talk to them, they don't know. They use words like empathy. But what is empathy to a person who is suffering? For you, you have the superiority that I know the right words, but that may not be the right word for the person who is suffering. So you fall back on music. Because music's words are far more primordial than yours and mine. Right? So let's take advantage of music. And it doesn't have to be a spiritual music. It could be the type of music that he or she always loved. Right? And the other thing that I'm a big proponent of is meditation. And again, meditation, you don't have to be like Buddha sitting under a lotus tree. You don't have to make it so complicated. You can just take a comfortable corner away from distraction. Close your eyes. Breathe in. Hold it. Breathe out. Just Google Harvard University breathing technique. They have come out with these breathing techniques based on our pranayama that we have always done. And this breathing technique from Harvard University has become a bestseller. Actually, in my previous book, um, John Denninger, he's the chief of Mind Body Institute in Harvard. He, he's a big proponent of me writing about these things for the, for the community in general. And he actually played a big role in, in my writing of the book. So again, meditation has been proved again and again and again that uh, it increases the electrical activity of the brain. And again, it does not have to be a very complicated process. It is just about breathing in and breathing out. And as a matter of fact, the very wish, the very wish to meditate actually sets the ball rolling. I, I, I was invited at Harvard University and there I met a German scientist who actually enlightened me on a fantastic research work that they have embarked upon. And I'm very tempted to share this with you. And I know I'm keeping an eye on the time also, where there were two groups of students, they were uh, divided into two. One of them was told that you listen to the music that you want, okay, or do whatever you want to do for entertainment. And the other group was told you meditate. But the scientist who did the experiment, he did not make any hard and fast rules that, hey, you 20 meditate, and hey, you 20, you do other stuff of entertainment. He simply said that you decide. So by themselves, those 40 students, they broke themselves apart, and 20 of them said, you know what, I love to meditate. And 20 of them said, you know what, I love to play around. I love to listen to jazz or whatever. Before they could start, the scientists said, stop. You don't have to do it. It's enough. And I'm going to do the MRI and the CT scan. And lo and behold, it was found that those who simply wished 
to do the meditation, and I'm repeating myself, those who simply wished to do the meditation, their electrical activity was already higher than when compared to the others who just wanted to do a casual entertainment. That shows the power of a mind. A simple wish can become an effort, can become, can show the effects. A simple wish. So we can imagine how much you can help your brain if you actually start meditating or just doing this breathing techniques. And the fourth point is mindset. Mindset is very important. You know, positivity is very important. And this is another very uh, popular anecdote that I share with my, um, wherever I'm called upon to speak. I was actually asked, what, is, what exactly is negative? Dr. Sen, you always say, you know, get, get rid of negativity. And I give an example. I said, negativity is this. You called up your daughter and you had a discussion for 20 minutes. Of that 20 minutes, 18 minutes was a fantastic discussion. The last 20 minutes, you had a fight. But you spent the rest of the day thinking about those two minutes of fight right. and not mm -hmm. 18 minutes of wonderful discussion that you had. That is negativity. Right? So mindset is very important. Looking into the brighter aspect is very important. Trying to remain positive is very important. And you can always ask me back why. Simply because it brings down the stress level. We are stressed yes. out because we are constantly thinking about the negative aspects of life. Oh, it is. And the only way to stop this stress level is to think about the positive things of life. I, I tell my patients, and not just my patients, when I do my community service, like I'm talking to, to my community, I tell them that keep a gratitude diary. A diary where you write down in a single day how many people you've met today who has helped you directly or indirectly. Could be the person in the grocery store. Could be the car that stopped while you were crossing the street. Could be anyone. If you write down at the end of the day, you will actually find five or six people who have done something to you and you express your gratitude. How can you not have a beautiful life if you have six or seven people every day who played such an important role in your life? So this ability to be grateful is a positive aspect to us. Like you just remind yourself at the end of the day, who are those people who have given you a smile, who have said hello to you? And just be grateful to them. If you start listing them, I promise you, after one month, every day, every night, you will find at least 10 to 12 people who have either said thank you to you or have smiled at you or has done something which, is, which has been good to you. So motion, music, meditation, and mindset. That will prevent Alzheimer's. Perfect. Thank you so much for giving us this crash course. Very elaborate. In fact, uh, Dr. Sen, I remember uh, you know this uh, anecdote from your book about the Christmas night. So, so thank you for... Uh, you know, surfacing it again. Um, the next question is related to, uh, you know, tips around meditation. You know, what is the exact, uh, you know, and you already touched upon it. And what I also remember reading in this book is that you don't have to be an expert in meditation, but you're such a believer in meditation. Can you explain what happens to the brain and why is it beneficial and why you're such a big proponent of it? So just let's deep, dive a little deeper into that. Okay. Since you gave me the space to dive in, I'll dive in. But I promise I'll, I'll keep it within three to four minutes. I'll start with a story. There was a gentleman called Rickard Mathieu. He's from Paris. He, he was at the threshold of everything that is achievable and beautiful. By the time he turned 25 and 26, he's finished his PhD. Both his parents are illustrious individuals in the field of art and science. But once he finished his PhD here in genetics, in genes, he realized that he's searching for the truth. And the truth is not in his PhD. The truth is not in his genetics. So he was reading various books and he came across this man who was meditating under the Himalayas called His Holiness Dalai Lama. So he took, a, he took the plane and he went to Dalai Lama and he said that I'm searching for truth. 
I've done my PhD, I've done my education, but I don't think that there where the truth lies. So Dalai Lama gave him an offer, a complete offer, that I can help you to search the truth if you shift your base from Paris to here. And he agreed. And he said, all you have to do is to come and you meditate with me. Enjoy the peace and the tranquility of the mountains, the harmony of the mountains, and close your eyes and have fun with meditation. But I warn you that it might take longer than your PhD. It's not a sharp bend. It's a wide arc. It's not a pill to be swallowed with a glass of water, as you guys do, the rest of the world. It's going to take time, but it's fun. So he took a conscious decision and he decided that I'm going to come to the foothills of the Himalayas and spend a couple of years with this man and see whether I can seek the truth and what meditation does. So he, what he did, he called up one of his very close friends in Wisconsin, a neurologist known as Dr. Richard Devison. And Dr. Richard had a grand plan. He said, oh yeah, is that what you're doing? Why don't I also take the plane and go to his holiness Dalai Lama. So he takes the plane and goes to Dalai Lama and says, I have a proposal for you. And his holiness said, and so what's the proposal? He said, my friend, Ricardo Mathieu is completely brand new to meditation. I want to do an imaging on his brain. And then when you, while you lead him to a series of med meditation, I want to do a series of brain imaging. I try to find out whether this meditation has any effect. Don't get me wrong. I'm not doubting your policies, your holiness, but I really wanted to put it under the microscope. Dalai Lama said yes to it. And so this wonderful journey started where he learned the, the types of meditation and I'll talk to you about it. And I'm no priest, you know, so. Uh, and he started to meditate. And then he started to take the flight to the Wisconsin lab. And then they all wired him up and they did EEG, electroencephalogram, to, to measure the waves. They did functional MRIs, various types of MRIs, which actually tracks oxygen supply. Because if you have more electrical activity, you need more blood. And for blood, you have more oxygen. So functional MRI does the functional aspect of the brain to see how much of oxygen you have. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they found that in a span of five years, there was a tremendous electrical change in Ricardo's brain. There's a certain organ in our brain, you know, and I'm very tempted to share this with you and with everybody, and I'm quite sure you have heard about it. It's called amygdala. This yep. amygdala is the center of our emotions. And it was found that this amygdala actually increased in size so that BBC the British Broadcasting Corporation, they actually, they ran a big story on this, this, this combination, this triad of His Holiness Dalai Lama, Ricardo Matthew, and uh, Professor Dawson. And he said, the happiest man on earth. That was the title of that essay. Because it was found that his amygdala was actually much increased in size. So this is a direct proof of what meditation does from ground zero, for somebody who never did that meditation, to five years down the road. Now, to answer to your other question, well, the type of meditation, it's for the monks to say, but before you say that, I'm reminded of something. I, I speak on the spot, so I'm, I'm reminded of various anecdotes, and I don't want to slip through my fingers. Mm -hmm. I actually did, did a survey before I wrote this book on Alzheimer's, on the various monks across the world. And I'm talking about priests, talking about nuns, talking about sadhus, talking about rabbis, talking about all religion. And I just picked up the center and I just called them. And I informally asked them, can you do a little bit of a survey on your own and let me know how many sadhus, how many monks, how many rabbis, how many of all religions actually had suffered from Alzheimer's? You won't believe, Isaac, from each quarter, the results was 
a complete zero. Mm. Their survey clearly says none of these people, none of these people had suffered from these cognitive disabilities. They might have had blood pressure. They might have had high cholesterol. They might have had diabetes. They might have other things. But when it came here, there was a strikingly space of no cognitive disability with this group of people. Right? And, and I have that in the book, where I actually share that if you look the other way around, compared to physicians, a lot of physicians get into Alzheimer's, from physicians to writers to musicians to actors, actors actually the other group who have shown very less amount of, and there's a tremendous amount of research that's going on. I'm actually leading one of them. Why actors and actresses have less amount of Alzheimer's? So we got to, you know, we got to see this disease from various angles and try to come to a conclusion. But the, the cut and dry answer to your question is there are two types. You know, there is a mindfulness meditation and there is a transcendental meditation. Very simply speaking, mindfulness meditation is that breathing technique where you follow your breathing. You know, we use terminologies like relaxed awareness, relaxed unawareness and all that. Those are, those are difficult concepts to conceive. I would say just the breathing technique of concentrating on your breathing in, holding it like a plateau, and then breathing it out is, is mindfulness meditation. And the transcendental is actually the easier one where you pick up a, a, a word, maybe have a name for it, we call it a mantra, but it could be any word, and you just repeat the word. You focus your whole attention on that particular repetition of the word. You know, and I know that, you know, Beatles, for example, uh, you know, the Beatles were big proponents of uh, transcendental meditation because they found it easier, because they play music, because, you know, they, f they follow notes, you know. So it's e it was easier for them to do transcendental meditation, but it's a personal choice. But at the end of the day, giving yourself 10 minutes of time, I do that. You know, 10 minutes of time, 15 minutes of time. I can be a very busy doctor and then I write and then I'm into various organizations. So the end of, end of the day is literally <clears throat> my end of the day. But I can still close my eyes and I can still breathe in and breathe out. And I think that helps a lot. That helps a lot. And the other thing that I would like to say, and I would like to end on that tone on that particular question, is that like many things else, meditation can also be addictive. I've seen that. I mean, you, you struggle for the first five minutes, but I promise you after five months, you will not struggle. And you will have the propensity, the tendency to go for the sixth minute, for the seventh minute, because there's something that you like about it. Something about following the breathing pattern, which is very addictive. I have not proved it, uh, but, uh, but this is something that I can say from my personal experience. Thank you for that. Uh, once again, you've been very, very practical with, with the suggestions. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's wonderful. And, you know, if you're following the chat, there are already a lot of people who are putting in the 4M technique, you know, back on chat and saying that, you know, this is the most simplified version of something to take uh, away from the session. Here is a Thank question you. that we get a lot, um, Dr. Sen. This is uh, from somebody from our community who is a 51-year-old female. But I can tell you this is the most commonly asked question, uh, you know, to us as community members. When people say that they are forgetting names or things, um, what is really happening and how should they take care of it? And this is very normal with aging as, as you might be getting with your patients. Okay. Beautiful question. Now, before I answer to that question, on my screen, I had uh, someone named uh, Ms. Varsha who actually wrote in the chat, Isaac, that uh, sh she is finding it, she finds it difficult to meditate. Hmm. Uh, so I just want to, if, if it's sure. okay with you, if I just yeah, quickly... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let's, let's go with that. Yeah. This is something which is which every alternate of my patients in the Western world, uh, they come and ask me, Dr. Sen, thank you for your wonderful lecture. We loved it. I love you. But you know what? I was trying to do it, but it's impossible. This is what I say, because this is what they do in, at Columbia University. Most undergraduates and graduates, including my son, they follow a meditative music. There are various meditative music. You don't have to meditate. If you're struggling with meditation, if you're even struggling to close your eyes, take a corner, and listen to some sorts of meditative music, and I'll be happy to share it uh, with, with, with Isaac later on. And I have the links for those meditative music that are routinely used at, at the various uh, university levels. That will help you. Just listening to that music, you don't have to do anything. You can just actually be doing your daily chores. You can be making your coffee. You can be doing your stuff in the kitchen. 
You can be knitting a sweater, but you keep that meditative music behind you, and that will serve the purpose. All right. So anyway, to come to this this particular question um, about I'm forgetting names, I like to make a very strong comment here. Forgetting names of people, forgetting names of the capital of various countries is not Alzheimer's. And you should not have anxiety and you should not panic. Now, why am I saying it's a very strong statement? Because research is also showing that just like in stress, anxiety is one of the prime risk factors for Alzheimer's. So take that anxiety out of your brain and throw it away. Forgetting names is very common with me. It's very common with me. And I'm telling you as a professor, when I lecture, sometimes I forget names. And I have to actually, I change the topic. And then I remember it again. You know? So forgetting proper names. It's okay for me to forget Isaac's name. Okay? And I'll remember it the very next second. It's, it's completely okay. That is not Alzheimer's. What is... And I'm not saying what is Alzheimer's. What should raise our awareness is when we forget common names. And I'll give you an example. If I, I'm wearing these glasses, and if, if I say, you know what, Isaac, can you just remind me what, what is this? Again, that's not Alzheimer's. Don't panic. That is something that, that's the time when you should go to ivory. That's the time when you should go to platforms like this where uh, you know that you're wearing a ring or you're wearing a, a, a watch and you just don't remember being called a watch. So to answer to your question, common names. If that's troubling you, that you opened a door but you just did not know what you opened, that should not bother you, but that should raise that awareness in you. That, okay, it's time for me to go to a doctor, right? So forgetting your... And I'm reading the screen, names of people, words, things that I use less often. There you go. Okay. And I, after I remember, this is perfectly all right. It's perfect. Do the meditation. And if you can't do the meditation, listen to the meditative music. The sharpness will come back. But that is not Alzheimer's. That's not what Alzheimer's is about. And there's another uh, thing, if I may, I will share with you because I shared this, this particular thing. The beginning of the beginning of Alzheimer's comes in various ways. You know, I don't know whether that's another question that's coming up, but you know, it's very it's very tiptoe, very hushed, very slender, very slim, and one of them is forgetting these common words. So the gentleman who always said that I like to have a toast with with uh, with uh, bread and jam, I like to have an omelet, a vegetable omelet. I, I like to have an orange juice. I like to have a pancake. If he or she starts forgetting those things, because those are not proper names, and instead he just says, I like to have breakfast. Now, to the family, this is a perfectly legitimate word. Mm. You just might say, oh, this guy's getting lazy. He knows that he's getting the omelet every day, so he doesn't mention that. But that could be the beginning, where you're actually forgetting those details, common words, common names, right? And And... And you're just saying an uh, even more common blanket name called breakfast. Only the other day I was listening to a talk uh, by this gentleman from uh, this great university, Harvard. And, and he was saying that sometimes family members, they miss if someone is slipping into Alzheimer's. So it's good to have friends come in. When friends come in, they see the big change because they are probably seeing that person who is at that edge of getting into an Alzheimer's after six months. And, and, and then they see the change. The reason I'm saying this is because this slipping into Alzheimer's can be very slow, can be very gradual. It doesn't have to be fast and furious. Although I have example of someone who just got into Alzheimer's. He was writing a letter. She was actually writing a letter. And ironically, she is a doctor to her husband. And she started by saying, you know, dear beloved uh, and all that. After the paragraph, she ends the letter and says, your beloved daughter. She, she loses her identity through an email, through a, a letter. It can be that fast and furious, but usually it's like a glacier. It's very slow. So yeah, so to, to back to the question and the answer, please don't panic. Don't be anxious because anxiety is a risk factor. Throw it away. It's very, very normal. And, and uh, just listen to good music. Listen to good spiritual meditative music and you should be good. Great. Great. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Sen. Um, 
here's here's another question which is also on similar lines but um, you know it's almost like though it may not be the beginning of alzheimer's they would like to know the why of it so you spoke about what should not be a concern but can you throw some light on the why of it why so the question is why we get alzheimer's no why people sometimes keep forgetting the present and names of people they meet regularly well that that why has to do categorically mm -hmm. with we, we use the word we hate to use it distraction you know some of us are extremely objective it's a personality i don't i don't want to use a personality disorder but what i'm trying to say is that it's a personality bias you know i will replace the mouthfuls by just saying two words side by side objective and subjective some of us are very objective our frontal lobe is very sharp and we remember you know we are objective okay i got a meeting at 10 o'clock and i'm preparing for that meeting at 10 o'clock and hey you don't disturb me make sure you don't call me objective but there are people who are very subjective subjective people they are spread out if they if you're spread out you will miss those common names and I've seen, again, I'm bringing back actors and writers, you know, they are very spread out. They're very diverse. They will miss those little names on that. And again, I will harp on the same thing. Nothing to worry about. It. Nothing to worry about. It. And if you really, if it really bothers you, seek refuge in meditation. Because meditation helps you to focus. Meditation helps you to remember. Whether it's a long-term memory or a short-term memory. You know, we have so many different types of memories. Meditation helps in that. You'll see something that, you know, the, the, the previous question was, I'm forgetting words. I'm forgetting names, right? Those are factual memories. But there's another type of memory called emotional memories. You will remember where you met your beloved. You'll remember all the gory details of that because it, it's, it's, it's got emotion atta attached to it. But if it is cut and dry, like the names, okay, you will tend, tend to forget. The factual memories, they slip away faster than emotional memories. You know, I'm, I'm very tempted to share another story with you because I know I'll, I'm going to forget it, talk about dementia uh, when, I, when I go to the other question. One of the non-pharmacologic therapy that's been used in a nursing home in Germany, and, and, and please allow me to share this story with you. What do we say? We say that in a nursing home, the doors are bolted because you're afraid that an Alzheimer's patient will stray away. In that particular nursing home in Munich, the doors are not bolted. They're not closed. In front of the nursing home, there is a makeshift bus stand. In that garden, they have a bus stand. Now in that bus stand, no bus comes. But people just come out suffering from all these cognitive disorders, including Alzheimer's, and they sit quietly in that bus stand. Now you and I know that bus stands hold strong memories for us. Either I'm waiting for my beloved to come or I'm waiting for my grandson to come from, you know, from the school bus or I'm running away and taking shelter from the rain. And lo and behold, they actually find that these patients, they actually cross the door, they sit in the bus stands, each of them immersed in their own memories and not one of them will cross the street and stray away. They are, they are beautiful, profound, tender, lovely memories hold them together, right? So these are emotional memories. They go away late. They linger, right? They're like music. They'll stay, right? Whereas the factual memories, they tend to slip away. And it is physiological. It is normal. And once for all, do not have any anxiety on that. If you cannot remember the name of Dr. Sen, celebrate. Don't worry about it. It will come back to you the next day, all right? Doctor, one of the things that I'm realizing, we do a lot of these sessions, I think you are one of the most, uh, you know, positivity spreading, you know, voices out there. That much I can, uh, you know, tell you on behalf of everyone at Ivory and the community. Um, let's continue. Um, this should be a simple one for you. Uh, is Alzheimer's hereditary? To be very honest with you, I, we are coming across hundreds and thousands of Alzheimer's patients and they have no history in their family. Now, you can always argue and say, uh, you know, there's something known as atavism. Atavism means that it skips certain generations. There was no concept of Alzheimer's in the 19th century, in the 18th century. So I don't know whether four generations back there was an Alzheimer's 
and then that gene decided to skip four generations and came back. As of now, we don't say, we do not say that it is out and out hereditary. That being said, there are certain genes that you and I can be born with. All right. It's, again, I hate to give uh, uh, mouthfuls in in such a beautiful public platform, but you know, just for the sake of it, you know, apolipoprotein. You know, that's that's one of the things. You know, apolipoprotein and E, uh, we say E P A P O E and all that. So some of us can be brought with this type of genes, and there are certain types of these genes we call alleles, A L L E L S. If those are present, there is a high propensity of having Alzheimer's at a very young age, but that that percentage is very very slim. So as of now, we cannot ever say that Alzheimer's is out and out hereditary. It can come as an isolated situation. All right. Uh, we'll move on to the last two questions. There are also one or two that are coming on chat. I'm not sure we'll be able to take everything, but, you know, uh, we do have a direct line with the doctor in case, you know, we are not able to answer everything today. We'll try and get you these on the community. So I'm just going to move on. And um, here's something that's a little more specific, uh, doctor, uh, you know, from a, from a, you know, community member. Is there any holistic approach for bipolar disorder to make it manageable or curable? Well, first of all, I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, that being said, uh, I do have patients with cancer and bipolar disease, with diabetes and bipolar disease. And a doctor is a doctor at the end of the day. So I should be able to uh, answer to this. Uh, see, bipolar is a little different kind of a cognitive disorder. And I'm not going to give you a lecture on bipolar. Time is of essence and I'm looking at it. I'm only a few minutes away yeah. from ending this wonderful conversation. It has various types, you know, bipolar one, bipolar two, and there's another three which is coming up, cyclothymic we call it. So in, in certain types of bipolar, and I'm going to keep it very short, you have more of excess energy, more of that maniac form. And the other types of bipolar, you have more of the depressive form, the alternate. The essence of bipolarity is restlessness, is instability. You are like, like the oscillations of a genius. You know, you move from one arc of the pendulum to the other arc of a pendulum. And there are medications for that. You know, and I'm obviously not going to give you the names of those medications, but I can give you a blanket name. Mood stabilizers is one of them. You know, we stabilize the mood disorders. But holistic approach is definitely, definitely a strong psychotherapy. There are various types of psychotherapies we have. CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, whoever is asking the question, please approach the behavioral um, consultants. Uh, and there is another known as exposure therapy, where you expose yourself to those things that stresses you. And you expose them so many times that it desensitizes you. And in the long run, you become a master. In, in controlling that situation, which has always stressed you out, you know? Uh, so there are, you know, these known as an interpersonal social rhythmic therapy. You know, these are big names where they actually do a lot of holistic uh, approaches here. Meditation plays a big role, a huge role in bipolarity. I'm a very big fan. And again, you don't have to sit like a Buddha. Listen to the meditative music. Let them go in. And I've given you my personal examine of this tremendous reach of spiritual music inside your brain. Take advantage of that. And yes, there are holistic approaches for bipolar disorders. Absolutely. Got it. Very encouraging. This is again a, a you know, specific question, but again, could be beneficial for a lot of people. Can myelopathy be stopped from progressing further? Well, myelopathy, let's break it up. Pathy is path. Path is pathology. Anything which is abnormal. And myel means, um, myel actually means muscles you know so if you have a problem with I, I there are so many causes of myelopathy okay it's a medical question and i would love to answer it uh, it would depend upon that particular cause of that myelopathy if there is a herniation in the spinal cord it calls for a surgeon to fix it if there's a stenosis which means narrowing of the cord which is calling myelopathy um, surgery is going to help it can, can it be stopped? It will depend so much on the cause. And I will not uh, give you any false answer on that. In certain cases, it cannot be stopped. The signs and symptoms can be made better, but the, the disease per se, because of the neurosurgical 
um, source or genesis, um, sometimes it is very difficult to stop its, its progression. But there are many, many treatments where its progression um, may not be stopped, but the signs and symptoms, the suffering can obviously be taken care of. Got it. And, uh, you know, I just want to be uh, conscious of uh, taking questions which are very patient specific. So I'm going to skip this one. I do have, uh, you know, one more question that I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Sen, which is to, you know, in your book, just coming back and, you know, wrapping it up with, you know, you use a word called non-pharmacological very frequently, especially towards the latter half of, you know, disease management. Um, and, you know, you've touched upon some of those, uh, you know, 4Ms. Um, I want to sort of end this session as a last question. Um, why are you so inspired by non-pharmacological uh, interventions, especially as a doctor who is very well known, to, you know, doctors are known to give away medicines and x-rays and MRIs, but you know, you are one voice which sort of really focus on non-pharmacological interventions. So if you can spend a couple of minutes on that, uh, you know, it will be wonderful for, for everyone listening in. I think it's coming with age. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been in this business of saving lives for uh, many, many years. And uh, and I prescribe on a regular basis. Uh, but these medications, they're great medications. I'll, I'll continue to prescribe them. But they're not exactly angels in the sky. They have their own sweet side effects. And the next thing that you know, you're actually dealing with their side effects. And you have another set of medication which is dealing with their side effects. So it's a very drug-dependent society. Anything, you know, anything that happens with the body you should give the body a chance to cure itself. We don't give that chance. But that does not mean that if you have a sore throat, you don't take the antibiotics. But when it comes to prevention, non-pharmacologic methods are the way to go. And, 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 the, and, the cure, and the cure of a certain disease can be better achieved if we can prevent it from coming. Remember I said any disease, they have anticipation, they have prevention, they have cure and cure. Mm. We can cure a lot of our sufferings by these non-pharmacologic methods, by, by even making them a disease. You know, we say you nip it in the butt. So we can nip it in the butt by these non-pharmacologic ways. And that's where I am such a big proponent of holistic methods. How many times I have come across two brothers, both of diabetes. One of them gets into kidney failure, dialysis, and dies. And the other cures it. And when I research, I find out one of them is a school teacher who enjoys uh, teaching and the other was a businessman. Now he was into so much into stress, so much. So there's so much effect that stress does on it. And, and to take this anti-anxiety pills, I'm so much against it. Simply because first of all, they have their own strong adverse effects. And number two, there's another thing that I want to convince everyone is that they have tolerance. In other words, 0.5 milligram of let's say a lorazepam that we give as an anti-anxiety is going to work beautiful for you and me. But I, I swear to God, you're going to come back after five months and you're going to say, you know what, Dr. Sen, 0.5 is not really working. Can you make it one milligram? You're going to come back again and you're going to say, can you give me two milligrams? Because for every medication, there is a tolerance effect. But there's no tolerance for listening to music. There's no tolerance for being positive. There's no tolerance for meditation. There's no adverse effects. Why? I mean, it's, it's staring at our eyes. Right. So, yes, I'm a big, big uh, proponent of uh, non-pharmacologic methods. Got it. No, thank you for that. If you have two more minutes, doctor, I would like to take one or two questions that have come on chat. Um, sure. You know, so let me just begin with um, this one. There's also a lot of gratitude for you and about, uh, you know, words about your energy and, uh, you know, like the fact that, you know, you're giving away great lines. Um, so the question is, um, this is, why has my left brain shrunk? Is it due to age? Uh, this is a question from our participants. Uh, we don't know if it is true or not, but is it, is it something that you can delve into? Nothing shrinks physiologically. Um, there is a terminology that is up in the air in today's world. We call it neuroplasticity. It simply means the growth of nerves. And you know what we found? We found that even for a 95-year young, Mm -hmm. I've dropped the word old. 95 year young, there is neuroplasticity. So nerves are constantly growing. If you, we say to rest is to rust, right? I can have a 25 year old, 
I can have a 95 year young. It all depends upon how much you're using it. So nothing shrinks. Constantly, it's growing. Constantly, it's growing. The pace can be different, right? We just have to keep it active. If you keep it active, you're as young. Got it. And the next question is, at what age is it normal to forget general words or lose a train of thought? This is, again, something that will be on lots of minds. Yeah, yeah. There's no age. There's no age at all. As I said, factual names, it's okay to forget. It's okay to forget. Some of us will forget earlier than the others. It's only because, for example, when I watch Jeopardy in, 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 in the television channels, I'm amazed how do they remember things. It's just their frontal lobe is tremendously developed. They are objective. They can remain facts. But those who are creative, those who are artists, those who are diverse, they may not remember the facts. And that's perfectly all right because their temporal lobe, which is the seat for all creativity, is very strong. And that compensates for the frontal lobe. And those who are very factual, they actually are not that creative. I've seen that. Because they're very factual, right? So there are two types of personalities. And, and, and again, and I'm repeating, and I'll continue to repeat. They, first of all, there's no age. There's no age at all that I can say, okay, you know what? After 55, I'm going to start forgetting names. No, that's, that's, very, uh, that's being very myopic. Uh, there's no age on that. But factual names, slipping of those factual facts and figures are okay. And um, just keep practicing. You, 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 will, you, you, will, you will remember those names. If you, if you practice. No, thank you. Thank you so much. We're just a little over time, but really, really appreciate your time, Dr. Sen. As I said, you know, we do these sessions often, but we haven't yet come across such a, you know, positivity spreading, uh, you know, speaker in our community session. I'm sure there will be, there would have been a lot more questions if we had time, but we wanted to be respectful uh, of your time, Dr. Foremost. And, and thank you so much. Uh, if there are any parting words, uh, doctor, we're all listening. We will leave the last words to you. Um, and, and just want to uh, hear from you on anybody who is probably a caregiver, because you spoke about that bit in the in initial part, which I found so fascinating that all of us are doctors if we have somebody at Alzheimer's at home. So would love for you to end it on a parting note of one or two words of advice for any caregiver who is listening in or, you know, who we might share this recording with. What would be your words to say? And why did you say that, you know, everybody is a doctor when it comes to Alzheimer's? Because... Alzheimer's is not a solitary disease. It's, it's a disease which needs courage, it needs compassion, which needs connectivity, and it needs the whole family to be with the one who is suffering. And it's an emotional disease. And a caregiver should not be a single person. A caregiver should be the wife, should be the husband, should be the grandchildren, should be everyone. We, we should all be a part of a problem and we should all share a solution. That's, that's what Alzheimer's calls for. It's an emotional disease. It's a family disease and no one else uh, has the right to suffer alone. We will all be together in this and uh, together, it's, it's a journey together. And it's a wonderful journey. And I tell my Alzheimer's patients, caregivers, that never think that he or she is not recognizing you. Love cannot go away. No disease has the power to vanquish love. The expressions are not there. It may not surface as an expression. Deep down, like a stream, it's still trickling, right? All we have to do is to shake hands. All we have to do is to shake hands. It's a new interaction, but not a new relationship. The relationship is there. That's it. That's all that all that we say. Thank you so much for ending this on such a, you know, massively hopeful note, Dr. Sen. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, everyone, okay. for listening in. We'll share the recording across. And just a reminder, once again, this is the book that Dr. Sen has written. Uh, we will send across the Amazon link shortly. Like I said, uh, quite a few of us at Ivory have read it. It's a phenomenal book. And, you know, you've heard some of the, uh, you know, stories that Dr. Sen has, you know, put together today. He, of course, quoted only two anecdotes. There are multiple such anecdotes. So please do check it out when we send out the link to you know everyone. And 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 doctor, we have a you know three and a half thousand plus strong community. So this will go out to everyone. Um, yeah, along with the recording. So once again, uh, thank you. Uh, this was thank this you was so wonderful. Much. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Sen. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Now, how do I? Go yeah, out? I'll exit that meeting. For you, doctor, not a problem. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.